Hey everyone, STM Kahuna back again, and I am joined by my illustrious cohorts, STM Outcast and STM Richie. How are we doing, gents? Not bad. Not bad. Not, not bad, bad. Not bad. Not bad. Good to Some hear. Some deja vu happening. I don't know why. Yeah, the the, the might have been a small. Like we've done this before. It feels, feels that way. There might have been a small technical difficulty in the uh, the first run of. There's uh, a glitch in the matrix, man. Let's get indeed. Over it. Yeah. I took both the red and the blue pill, and it resulted in a purple pill, and that resulted in non-recording, but audio was working, so... Where did this Yeah, I forgot to switch on, like, that machine there. Yeah, th 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 that one is responsible one for is the... The, re the recording, yeah. Uh, that one. I see SDM Richie has located himself to the SDM uh, mainframe hub, also doubles as the back cave at the weekends. It's, it's a multi-purpose facility. Uh, we don't normally we show it to the public. Like this. Yeah. Now we, we, <laughs> we thought the SDM network needed to show the the investment that we, we put into our videos and uh, yeah. Uh, Wayne it, Tech it clearly shows. Yeah, uh, Wayne Tech Enterprises is amazing. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we will not be showing the live action Batwing at any stage. Uh, unfortunately, none of us are certified to fly it. Uh, <laughs> despite despite our best efforts, it's just not happened. It's in the shop. Yeah, they, 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 that'll work. People believe that. This is all very random. But hey, no, thanks to you guys. Uh, this is the uh, late night edition of the podcast. Uh, we've kind of been doing a bit of testing and whatnot, trying to improve the production, shall we say. And uh, as a result, thought we'd just roll with this after the testing. So hence coffee and hence the late night. But yeah, so news and views so i'm gonna kick off this week with uh what's been my favorite story uh somewhat terrifying one as well is uh you may have noticed a couple of weeks ahead of the the black hat uh security hacking event that takes place every year a couple of gents released some news to the general press and to the chrysler motor corporation that yeah you can hack some modern models of the uh Chrysler brand uh, wirelessly and not only can you hack said devices but you can control the bloody things as well I think the most terrifying thing of the the tests that have been carried out with this is the fact that the the system <coughs> has obviously you have like electronic stability control and ABS which is all electronically managed nowadays uh, no such thing as just outright hydraulic control so yeah the system well it doesn't register a, a physical press on the brake pedal and that would normally engage the hydraulics or the electronic control uh the ecu registers a press and you can stop the damn car dead you can lock out other systems and yeah that that is just why is that even like linked to the wireless system though make any sense why they would do that well that's the thing it's like you know Chry the, the the gents involved in this have said this like you know if chrysler don't patch it they're going to release i think they're going to release the code anyway but not the full code i don't understand how that is a kind of moral high ground on that standing uh but yeah the, they're obviously going to show the the gaps and the flaws in the system and i think it's a case of it you're exactly right why the hell is any of the fundamental controls of the car linked to the uh is wirelessly accessible why why are these systems even communicating I mean, to each other i know with uh, some of the american cars you can get it where you know you, you can call up your assist uh, on your stereo or whatever the hell it is they've got on there and they can mm -hmm. literally start your car for you if you've lost your uh -huh. keys or something. yeah i get that sort of thing but when it comes to like the you know for the functionality of the car you're just asking for trouble especially in this day and age i mean come on I mean, if if there's if there's something like that, someone's definitely going to you know, misuse it somewhere. Well, indeed. I mean, the, the list of cars affected range as far back as 2013. So this isn't new. This is obviously a system they've been using for the, the last 18 months, two years probably in production. And yeah, that that is a little bit concerning to say the least that you could literally... I mean, obviously the 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 kind of worst case scenario is somebody's driving along next to you in a car, the mates next to them with a laptop and they're hijacking the controls of your car. Now, 
w- would people do this? That would do that. Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> let's face it. There's, go, there's going to be people who would abuse that. that. If you got a chance. Uh, I mean, Chrysler have released statements on it, and this uh, currently unaware of any injuries related to software exploitation, nor is it aware of any related complaints, warranty claims, or accidents. So that's great, as long as you don't know something happened. <laughs> I do believe that's important. That it doesn't mean that it's not happening. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, but you know, let's face it. Chrysler's legal department must have had absolute kittens when that one came out. Uh, so this is not the the first time a car hacking system of this has gone down. Um, you've got the uh, uh, sat navs that were getting hacked recently, where people mm-hmm. can read where you've gone and they can actually just change the directions from where you're going. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, six they could... months ago or something like that, that come out, and it's like that's a bit scary, you know, things like that. And there was a guy in the states who managed to like worm his way into the uh, the police remote camera system for his local town, <laughs> so he could view all of the, the stored videos and live videos for all the police cars that were out and about with onboard cameras. Wow, which is pretty much all of them nowadays. Yeah, that's uh, again, that's just an absolutely terrifying. I mean, and that's I, a scary I, thing you got to think about now, though, right? Is they they can literally hijack the entire car. Now is that down to steering as well? No, I don't believe so. Uh, I don't because believe steering be is affected. I mean, that well, would be the next thing, though, wouldn't it? Like, it would let be a case where they'll hijack your car and take your car wherever the hell they want it to be. Well, let's face it. It's like, if if you yeah, if you take the hypothetical situation of you had a car like the Google self drive cars, then yeah, if you took over sat nav then you would also take over the directional control of that vehicle. So yeah, you could you know, route somebody's car to wherever you wanted it to go. Uh, with these cars, the, the steering's still mechanical. It's still rack and pinion steering. So there's no electronic control systems over that. With things like some of the, the Porsche 911 series, not that these, they have any of these affected systems, but yeah, that's electronic steering. In theory, you could take over that. You you could tell the system what inputs because it's not actually a mechanical link. You know, there's there's no rod connecting that to the uh, to the drive shafts to to just the the actual rake of the steering. It, it's one of these things. It's like I don't understand how, as you said, Outcast. I don't understand how people are building these systems, and obviously they're, they're not thinking about it because it's never happened before. They're, they're just saying to themselves that, you know. We don't need to make. We don't need to close this down. We don't need to protect it. It's good because it will obviously, lead, events like this will lead to it being closed down. But yeah, it's uh, you know, do we know that there hasn't been a, an event of this nature beforehand? That that's that's a bit that scares me. But yeah, Chrysler have well, has been. issued a recall for 1.4 million vehicles. I mean, that's that's a lot of potentially affected people. That's a lot. Of oh, that's a lot. Of money. Yeah. Yeah. And can I continue in that theme as well uh, about affected people? <laughs> and yet again, another hack. Uh, we have the news that the Ashley Madison website was hacked uh, and also hacked again by John McAfee several hours after the event. I don't know if uh, you're particularly familiar. I know you're all upstanding gentlemen, so... I had to read about this. I had to read about this one in the news before I knew what it was about. But yeah, the the Ashley Madison website is probably the most famous of a, a group of websites run by this same company. Uh, and well, the, the tagline for the the company's website is "Life is short, have an affair." So yeah, it it is for people. <clears throat> well, you know, it's like let, let's get to the point. Sex sells. It always has done from a marketing standpoint, and you know, if you're selling sex which I always thought was prostitution was illegal, but I, I suppose if you're just arranging a meeting, what is that? Some league? I, 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 I don't get it, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a way of life, isn't it? But yeah, the obviously the, the site was hacked. Uh, Avid Life Media, Ashley Madison's parent company, which also runs Cougar Life and Established Men <laughs> websites. We're clearly <clears throat> talking about classy individuals here. Uh, yeah, all the sites were hacked, uh, and yeah, something in the region of 50 million to 37 million accounts compromised. Now, the thing is, it's like, unlike 
you know, if your credit card gets, you know, if you get like identity fraud and credit fraud run up against you, you can like speak to the bank and they can obviously, you know, just stop transactions and return funds to you. This is some very personal information that's on this web, these websites. I mean, these things host everything from like sexual preferences and uh, fantasy and fetish and everything else. And yeah, uh, the, the the hackers involved have basically said that they want the sites taken down. And to a point, I can certainly get behind the motivation for that, if not necessarily the, the method. Well, I mean, I think it's... I don't know about that. I think really you're putting your nose into other people's businesses when you really shouldn't be. And then like hackers, yeah, you've, they've got the power to flip and you know do these things and steal people's information. But what people want to do with their own personal lives is completely up to them, and they're paying for a service at the same time. So these you know these people behind the website should be, you know, paying for the fact that, that the security of their information is obviously not as secure as what they, you know, they originally thought. But the, I think the hacker's motivation is. It, I mean, it's just, I think it's more of a religious thing than anything else. You know, they, they've, their beliefs are, you know, say, well, that's wrong for people to be cheating. So we'll hack them, shame them, and then they'll split up from their wives and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, who are they to say that that's, that should be done? You know, people could do whatever the hell they want with lives, but, you know, yeah, you get the, the yeah, crazy, no, it's like you get the saying, crazy religious nuts that they'll still give a fuck. You know? Yeah. yeah it's like child porn or something like that. Yeah, you know, I don't like, understand. No, I can understand that. You should definitely be taking those websites down. But at the end of the day, those websites all like, exist on like Tor and stuff like that. So why aren't they like these people live on there? So why aren't they on there taking those down so people can't do it rather than going on like the public web and taking down? Oh, no, no, someone's cheating on their wife or cheating on their husband. Mm -hmm. It's like well, end of the day, who cares? How does that affect you? You know, it's like yeah, someone's getting hurt, but it's, it's not for you to to judge, really. Yeah, I suppose you're right on that front. Yeah. Uh... It's not a criminal activity. It's not a legal activity. It's a morally objectionable one. It's like, yeah, I can still understand from, you know, a kind of moralistic standpoint where these people are coming from. But the thing is, it's like, they're obviously targeting a business that, and as you say, there are far bigger targets and far more worthy causes that they could be turning their efforts to. But one of the things that you said, Outcast, and is a true, is an interesting point about the whole story as well. It's like the, the Ashley Madison website offered the service where for $19, I think it was, I read in one of the reports, you actually paid to get your details removed from the website. And they guaranteed to wipe you from every single database. You know, it's like complete profile removal, no traces, absolutely nothing. That data was all still held and that data was all compromised. And, you know, Let's face it, this is America. They, they, they will sue you over anything. Can you imagine yeah. the liability involved? Now, regardless of whether the act is right or wrong in the first place, from a legal standpoint, if that gets out, and they've already released like two names, and a couple of people have been named and shamed, and obviously there's uh, th these people have huge personal repercussions to deal with. But let's face it, it's like, you know, if you get somebody who's maybe like a like one of your one percenters, you know, somebody who's particularly wealthy and they end up in a messy divorce and then, you know, several million dollars or whatever later for the divorce then takes place. You know, these people have the wherewithal to hire a legal team and they will take Ava Life Media and Ashley Madison to court. And it's like that, that, that has got to be screaming out because basically if you can turn around and prove it's like, well, I paid you to protect my data you Absolutely didn't liable. remove it yeah. you charged me for a service you didn't deliver and now i am x million dollars out of pocket i'm x thousands of dollars out of pocket. i'm x hundred whatever you know the, the there's going to be huge fallout from this service and they're not receiving it because it's not so discreet when the information is getting leaked all over the net is it so i mean imagine they i mean they must be completely liable for any financial uh, difficulties that the uh, you know the, the, the users are going to they uh, received by mar marriage breakups and whatever else, jobs getting lost and things like that because you know maybe their workplace doesn't agree with that type of thing or whatever. But um, yeah, they should definitely be liable for any monies you know, lost. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's not the first time we've seen sites get taken down. I mean, we we all remember 
you know, PlayStation Network getting hacked. We, you know, and and Sony did the right thing in that situation. I know this is a completely different argument, but Sony went and said, right, we are taking out insurance and we are going to make sure, you know, we took out fraud because we, we all got the emails for it saying it's like, you know, if, if you are a victim of any credit fraud or any identity fraud, then, you know, the insurance was covering you up to several million dollars. I mean, what po- what possible kind of stance can uh, can Ava, Ava Life Media Group possibly take for? Oh, you, you know, you didn't protect my information. It got out there. It's <clears throat> destroyed my life, harmed my family. You know, because you know, it's like you take a marriage maybe with kids involved. You know, counseling, therapy. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's just not quantifiable and probably beyond our. <laughs> kind of uh, legal and uh, psychological skills to to discuss and say, but yeah, it's yeah, but the, other, the other side of that. You've got yeah, it's like the fact that the information was leaked is the way that their partner found out. But from a defense point of view, it's like well, the the thing that really cost you all that money and your family was the fact that you were a cheating scumbag. <laughs> um, you know, if you never cheated in the first place, then you wouldn't be in this situation. So. You know, it's like the only thing they can say is like, you said you delete my data, you never. How much can I get for that? And, you know, it's hopefully they only get their nineteen dollars back because they're cheating scumbags. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean there's a lot of uh there's a lot of variance in that. And I think the argument comes down to I mean, certainly if it was here in the UK where, you know, data protection law, I don't know exactly how it sits in the the US precisely I'm sure it's fairly similar but we we all know it's like if you fail to deliver on certain stances to protect your customers information regardless of the usage of said information then you know heavy fines prison times involved in that but yeah no it's going to be interesting to see how that one develops but mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like it's one of those scenarios don't know whether to laugh or cry really to be honest but uh, yeah, we've we certainly started off with some weighty subjects, which is unusual for <laughs> us. Maybe it's because it's late. You know, maybe we're tired, old, and grumpy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw the next one over to uh, to to Rich. I'll let you pick from the uh, the list of various, various selectable topics. Well, what would you like to okay, discuss? So let me just uh, get a bit closer to actually get the list up. Um, I'd probably say Smite for all you guys that have played that. There's a, a little bit of news on that, as I believe during the beta, one of the characters you can play was Hercules. Uh, now they are releasing that as an unlock, so if you win 10 PvP battles, you will unlock Hercules. And one of the excellent things about that is that Kevin Sorbo is voicing him, and if you didn't know, what is wrong with you? And Kevin Sorbo, he voiced Hercules in the Hercules, is it The Legend Continues? Yeah, I something think like it that, was yeah. if memory serves. Yeah, along those lines. Yeah, but the Hercules TV show, which was like absolutely amazingly cheesy, he was. If there. you've seen Xena the Warrior Princess, you've bound to have seen Hercules at some point. Yeah, pretty much. Like Xena's like a made up character, and it was made up in the Hercules TV show. So, <clears throat> and there he is, right there, Retro Herc. Yeah. <laughs> None of these guys look like Hercules, but you know. I was going to say, yeah, there's there's definitely a little bit of a... Kevin Sorbo was the man. Although now he's like super skinny. There he is there. There's the man. There he is there. <laughs> like he used to be huge, like muscular-wise, and now he's just like, what? Yep, yep. So like, yeah, so definitely if you're a, a Smite fan, then that's definitely something you should look at getting as much as you can because, you know, Hercules is a classic character and Kevin Sorbo is, is the man. Indeed, and yeah, it's like we were having a little discussion about it before. It's like I've I've played a bit of Smite, and uh, yeah, uh, it's a fun mobile. I like the third person, uh, the third person playstyle versus the typical isometry that you normally see in your standard uh, kind of Dota and League of Legends. Oh. Annotation to the mm-hmm. Smite website right now. <laughs> oh lord. <laughs> No, 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 no. Come no, on, no. give people more. Come on. You Come know. on, Outcast. Come on. Move it on. Move it on. Come on. Yeah. I'm ushering. Well, if, if you're bored of the podcast, why not hop over to the STM Outcast Zero channel and watch one of my videos now? Um, right. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Silent Hills, Kojima, and Dotoro still plan on a project together. Sounds pretty cool. I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. two big names, in the, one in the film industry and one in the gaming industry. It's, uh, 
really, can it go wrong? I don't think so. Well, it's, uh, it's got potential. I mean, we all remember, uh, sorry, I'm going to take a slightly more reclined, <laughs> relaxed position now. It's getting a late. Nap in a minute. Yeah, well, I'm old enough, I could fall asleep, so. Uh, yeah, it's like, well, we all remember the, the Silent Hill PT kind of interactive trailer, and that garnered a huge response. It was a massive amount of stuff on that, on YouTube, when that released. And, yeah, it's like, don't get me wrong, I, I'm i a huge horror fan. I have been for, for, for years. Uh, I do have big issues with horror that relies on jump scares which tends to be the vast majority of most hor horror cinema nowadays where you're just sitting there oh, some eerie music to build tension and then something jumps out something really loud and you just get that coil and retraction and it's like that that's cheap you know uh isn't this i always find like those type of cheap scares like when you're watching a proper horror movie you kind of go home and you're like thinking, shit, is like, you know, like some sort of thing. <laughs> is there something behind the, is something behind the you're counter? Sitting, you're, you're lying in bed the couch. couch. At night and you're thinking about the movie constantly. But when it's jump scares, it's kind of like, and then half the time you expect it now. I don't think I've ever seen a scary movie in, I don't know, since maybe I was a kid. I, I can't really th think of anything I've watched, the, you know, the past 10, 15 years that I've went, Jesus Christ, that was scary, you know? Hmm. But, um, it's the same with yeah. like the same with like video games now. You got your uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. We're on like number four so far now, and it's like <clears> yeah, scares, that's all that's all jump scare stuff. related. You're expecting it, are you? So how is it scary yeah, yeah. when you're expecting it? But um, you know you don't have anything like Fatal Frame anymore, do you? <laughs> don't even mention that game to me, man. That still freaks me out now. Like, terrifying, <laughs> truly terrifying. Well, Fatal Frame or Project Zero is known in, in other locations, but uh, that was a yeah. scary ass game. <laughs> well, even like Fear, they, they did the scares quite good. Fear, Fear, too bad, yeah. Fear was brilliant, and that was one thing I was going to go back to, kind of back on topic, was with uh, at least Silent Hill PT. While I'm not a huge fan of jump scares, and certainly the videos I saw PT did have a lot of that, where it'd be, like, it'd be dark, but one thing that that PT did not that fear didn't have any jump scares because it certainly did and fear certainly has one of my all-time favorite gaming moments which I will recount in a moment but the the kind of psychological aspects you know the it was it wasn't silence and jump scares it was unnerving situations disturbing audio and exactly as you said outcast <clears throat> excuse me is the fact is a lot of the scenarios where you were walking into something and even though you I wasn't controlling the character involved, I could feel the dread building up because <laughs> you knew something was coming. You knew it wasn't going to be good. You've stepped into playing a horror game. That that much is obvious. But sweet Jesus did it. Just it kept you on edge. And yeah, I think, you know, Kojima and Del Toro are so off the wall. I mean, I love Del Toro. I've loved his work for years it's like yeah. uh, things going back to to chronos you know pan's labyrinth i mean i love the hellboy films uh, i i'm not ashamed to admit i i like pacific rim as well that oh that's not a scary movie i love pacific rim it's fucking amazing very colorful pacific rim's actually like <clears throat> pacific rim's got a really huge cult following on the on the webs and everyone's looking really excited to pacific yeah rim pacific rim too. too yeah oh hell yeah and as, as well you should because you know, it's a monster movie that gave you what you wanted, which was uh -huh. big ass robots beating the ever loving shit out of big ass monsters. I mean, Godzilla didn't really deliver on that front. Oh look, I like Godzilla. Uh, you know, Cloverfield. You never saw the bloody monster for like for all but the last ten seconds of it. You know, and I won't talk about the Matthew Broderick Godzilla because that's just awful. But yes, I can. Sean, I know. Sean, I know what you were doing. The only thing we got out of that whole even he wasn't cool enough to pull that out of the doldrums the, the Jamaraquai song and that was the best part of the whole freaking thing Deeper Underground yeah <laughs> still got that on my playlist I'm going one deep underground you know it's like I read wait recently, we better stop uh, or we'll get a copyright strike that's yeah, no, too close I read recently that Jean Reno turned down the part of Agent Smith in the Matrix to be in Godzilla Another bitch. 
I, I, I wonder if he regrets that decision. Well, I'm going back to point where uh, <laughs> Del Toro was quoted as saying, uh, obviously that you know he loves working with Kojima-san, and they're obviously still in touch after the Silent Hill PT project was cancelled. Uh, they're still very much in the planning stages. Obviously, Kojima, since uh, his falling out slash emotional breakup with Konami, is probably going to have some time and probably be looking for a project. I I, I think that's uh, something to look forward to if you're a fan of the Silent Hill series or just good horror as a whole. I think this game's got the potential to deliver. Mm, uh, yeah. I just, I just really worry that you know, we all know that Metal Gear it pretty much has changed into six hours worth of watching videos and about 30 minutes worth of gameplay. So <laughs> yeah. you can imagine, like, those two getting together and just fucking forgetting that they're actually meant to be making a game and just building a movie as such, you know? It's like, yeah, but see, that's, that's the thing. Like the, you never know. Uh... It might branch off into <laughs> doing actual movies now or something, you know? The 30 minutes of gameplay in the Metal Gear, 27 minutes of that is lying down. And not to be seen being stationary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very much. So that's that's my only worry. Like, but then, like I said, it might be a thing where Kojima decides he's going to start making movies or animated movies or something like that. Well, I, I think that's been certainly something that he he's certainly been had a proclivity for originally. Uh, I mean, the the storytelling in Metal Gear, as we all know, is off the wall, batshit crazy sometimes, and. It is a case of, yeah, you do need to replay the game more than once to get the basic first clue of what the hell has actually been going on. Uh, I know I've stepped away from it many times going, really? Okay, th this is a valid re... But, you know, we all love Metal Gear. It's like, th there's nothing not to love about it. But, yeah, I, th there is a worry that with a someone who is... Uh, director of Del Toro's kind of standing and skill, and someday with Kojima's penchant for telling a story, yeah, you you could end up with no gameplay and just like a really interactive movie. But uh, like, would you like gameplay? Well, buy it now for this, you know, this downloadable content. <laughs> <laughs> buy the extra ten minutes worth of gameplay for yeah. fifteen pounds. You know, yeah, buy the day one DLC, the actual game. Yeah, who knows? It's possible, but. But you know, PT looked like it had potential. You know, I think we uh, we, we could see something interesting come out of that pairing. Well, I don't know. Well, guess we'll see what happens on that front. But uh, yeah, for us next on the list of uh, suitably discussionable discussionable topics, ah yes, uh, broken sword, broken sword, broken sword. Oh well, uh, why don't you uh, lead on that one, sir? You are the well, I would consider both you and Outcast the authorities on this. So pray continue. I love Broken Sword. It's one of my favourite point and click games. I know a lot of people have got like Monkey Island and things, but for me, it's Broken Sword One. Um, and they have announced that Broken Sword, uh, Sword Serpent's Curse, will be released this summer on next gen consoles. Which is, I don't know how I have mixed feelings about that, uh, because I remember back in the old PlayStation One days when I played like Sim City Two Thousand. That was quite difficult to play. With a controller, because obviously it's point and click, so you're just moving a thing. I don't say controlling like a smart TV these days. Um, so I bought the mouse for the PlayStation One. Which oh my god, I remember greatly. that thing. <laughs> it was heavy and it was awful, but it was better than the controller. But I did read something recently. There was the goat a Twitter is back. from. Uh, <laughs> there was a Twitter from uh, Xbox Xbox's chief um, Phil Spencer. I think his name is. Yeah, he yeah, says yeah. That they are working, or it's still unconfirmed because it's Twitter only, but that mouse and keyboard support is coming to the Xbox. It's coming one, to the Xbox so. One, yeah. So they say point and click might be the the next thing for that. So I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, it's like a, I definitely might pick it up just to see what it's like, see how it plays, and things like that. So you never know. There may be a future video this summer for Broken Sword. Ah, uh, there's the uh, the cafe pre blow up. Can't argue with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, Russian's a little rusty. I'm, I'm guessing he's asking a question. Uh, uh, yeah. Do you hear uh, that ticking noise? Uh, do you see anything that look 
like a suspicious package that had been dropped off earlier in the day. Yeah, you, I believe he's looking for a clown that's... at this point, or like the, the 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 clown does the explosion, and then you have to spend quite a long time in the sewers picking up his nose and whatnot. <laughs> oh, you can't go wrong with random point and click logic. It's like I watched an interview with the uh, the maker of uh, Broken Sword, and it's like the the bit about the goat that I was mentioning. Obviously, the, like the the goat puzzle is like notorious because it's like exceptionally difficult how you get past this damn goat, and it's not obvious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he said the reason why he designed the puzzle to be so obtuse is he knew there were plenty of people out there, especially at this time, who understood point-and-click adventure game logic. Now, I don't know how people understand point-and-click logic because it's the most illogical thing in the world ever. I think 95% of the people who played point-and-click adventures... Now, I loved point-and-click. Now, I'm a big Monkey Island fan, you know. I defeated the Swordmaster of Skull Island and all I got was this shitty t-shirt. Uh, and I'm an even bigger fan of Sam and Max Hit the Road. And some of the stuff that you had to combine uh, to complete a puzzle, it's like the, the, there's nothing, there's no real life relation to that. So kudos to anybody who thinks in such a broken and obtuse fashion because I can't fathom it out. But I think yeah, we all... Like, you've got on top in the fact that we played point and clicks like Monkey Island and Broken Sword. Like, I played Broken Sword before I got the internet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so you had to find the answers out and you had to work it out. And that's the, the exactly. bit... The bit was... Discworld games as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. Discworld, Rincewind and Co. I loved those. But, uh, yeah, the, the bit was, it's like, we, we just used to take every item and combine it with everything else in the hope that you would find the combination that would actually move you forward, because you'd always see the bits you could interact with around the screen, like, oh, mm-hmm. I can click on this, I can click on that, I have these it'd items. Be slightly different colours, like, they'd be bright. Yeah, and there'd, there'd be stuff. something that would make it stand out and make it more more obvious, but yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, he, he threw in a bizarrely obtuse puzzle, specifically to, for all intents and purposes, to fuck with the people who were good at the game. Uh, and as yeah. you say... Well, like, I figured that. It took me hours and hours to figure it out. Mm-hmm. But I eventually figured it out. And um, speaking about it, it's like you just picked up anything. You just like, that was before the days of, you know, how much inventory space have I got and things like that. And I do remember, I can't remember which game it was, but there was a cheat for one game on the PlayStation 1. And the cheat name was George Stobart Pockets. <laughs> oh, God, what was that game? Infinite inventory. And it was like, that is brilliant. I love that. George Stobart Pockets. Oh, happy, happy days. Oh my god! I know what the ge- I, like. It's in the back of my mind what the game is, and I cannot remember. It's like not coming out. I'm, I'm googling it now. That's gonna haunt my dreams. Probably hear my keyboard clicking away. Apologies. You know, it was a good point and click adventure as well back in the day. Sanitarium. That was good. Never I used to mention like Legacy Larry. Well, I was actually yeah. going. to... You know what? I was going to make a quote about random things because I. Uh, I had the Leisure Suit Larry one, the the last decent one where it was uh, like cell shaded animation and he was on a boat. And I remember you had to get this Venezuelan beaver cheese and mix it with his orgasm powder, which you had to then pass on to like this judge of a beauty contest. So you would win or somebody would win. Uh, and yeah, how you made the Venezuelan beaver cheese. That's all I'm going to say. Look it up. If you don't know how, look it up. The guides are online. <laughs> Bizarre. I have, I have no idea how we got there. But the best thing is, like, the original uh, Legislative Lara, you had to uh, pass a quiz to get to play a game to prove you were over 18. Yeah. Knowledge would just ask you questions that you would only know the answers to if you were 18 or over. But it's really annoying when I play it, like, if I go to play the game now, because I still can't answer the questions because they're way before my time. I have to Google all the answers. <laughs> Yes, and that's the thing as well. Is it? that's one thing we certainly lose uh, a lot nowadays with the internet. Let's face it: if uh, if I get stuck on something now, I'll look it up. I'll find somebody who's done it on YouTube and then crack mm-hmm, on. Mm-hmm. I would say for a point and click adventure, if anyone's interested in playing anything that was maybe last gen, I would say Grey Matter is a pretty damn decent point and click adventure kind of a psychological frilly frilly type thing it's pretty decent it's out on everything xbox uh ps3 and the pc i played it on the pc but i do own it on one of the consoles at least 
Uh, but definitely, definitely worth a pick up if you're in that. It's still got the old Excellent. style graphics, but definitely, definitely worth a play. Yeah. Always good to have a recommendation. Yes, 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 yes. Now, sadly, my Google Foo has failed me. Uh, I cannot find a listing of the George Stobart Pockets cheat, sadly. So I, it will sure remain a mystery. If anybody who, who watches this knows what it is, please sign off in the comment section below. I'd love to remember where that one's actually from. But speaking of slightly more modern games and something that we're all a bit of a fan of, uh, Street Fighter V obviously started its uh, beta on PlayStation 4 recently. And, and I guess what can only be described as no surprise <coughs> to anybody has been suffering a, a massive log of connection issues and latency problems and disconnects and login and just general miserable network woes. Uh, there was a message posted on Capcom's Twitter feed on the 23rd, basically saying, like, yes, we're, we're aware of issues. We're taking the, uh, the servers offline for some extended maintenance. They brought them back on the 24th and had to take them back down again. The issues were still persisting. And yeah, this is this is not an uncommon thing. And when we consider the fact that 1996 was probably when multiplayer gaming really started to take off, uh, I, I just don't get why we, why we still have these issues today. I, I, I understand Capcom's probably never really invested in network infrastructure. Uh, probably never done dedicated servers before, but you know, let's face it, it's not that difficult to get a company who will assist you to do that sort of thing. You know? Yeah, why? It's like, um, Sony have got this... Um, it's like one of my friends works for um, PlayStation, mm -hmm. and he was telling me, is like basically their like server code to run all the multiplayer stuff, they basically just copy it from most games because it's like the back end's almost identical on most of their games, and it's just obviously the front end that's different. Mm -hmm. Um and that's how they most of their games when they come out on like PlayStation Network are reasonably stable because it's just that they, they've had it before, they've had it for years and it works, it just works and it doesn't need to be changed. You know, anytime they do a bug update, that obviously update goes across with the new games and things like that. So and it'll patch across like, everything, these, yeah. These new guys that come in try that and it's the one thing that gets me about like the old uh, Activision games and now the EA games, because EA are like famous for it. It's, I would never buy like a Battlefield game on first week of launch because you'll <laughs> never be able to play it, like, ever. Um, and Activision games are going the same, but they're all just, like, really terrible peer-to-peer, -peer, so it's their net code that's really broken, so. Well, yeah, this, like, we, we've always had that argument. As you said, it's like, we, we all remember <clears throat> viciously when Battlefield 3 was launched, and the the, the jokes that went around the web, it's like, Christ, what, it took, was about three days before we could get in solid and EA's press release was it's like yeah yeah and we we finally added more capacity onto the on our server farm to be able to handle the number of concurrent login attempts. We never expected there to be so many people. Uh yeah, bullshit on that front. It's like you had pre orders, you could take a general estimate, you've run these games before, you know. Battlefield Bad Company 2, anyone? You know, before Battlefield 3, how many people played that? Okay, let's take an assumption that 80% of the player base is probably going to pick that up. 70% if you want to take a marginal guess. And let's build capacity to handle that. But no, we don't want to invest. And I understand it's, it's, a, it's a financial risk and the companies probably don't want to take it until they can guarantee that they've actually got the sales to back it up. But yeah, it's like, you know you're going to get these sales. It's like, Battlefield never doesn't sell well. Battlefield 2, the most online playing game on the PC of all time. Yeah. That should be your benchmark when, when you're one of these companies. Like, when you're, when you're a company who made that game. Yeah. Now, they granted, make the same mistake every time. It's never just like, it's the one, like, oh, they brought out this, the game for the first time and didn't realise it was going to be that popular. It's every single bloody time, you know? It's just like... Please learn from your mistakes, for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Stop yeah. taking the piss. It's like, oh, we're trying to be all humble and underestimate our game. No, you're literally just taking the piss. It's like, yeah, watching, watching the money. 
watching the monies. What's and... now flowing in before the set, you know, spend. Oh, yeah, we've, we've just bro- we've just broke first weekend sales for the fifth game in a row. <laughs> Can't afford any sales. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, we we didn't predict that. It's like, wait a minute, like three weeks ago, the news was reporting that pre-order sales records had been broken. Um, well, that's it, is it? They're, they're waiting on everyone. Can you explain yourself? Because they're like, yeah, you know, we'll ma- we'll minimize the cost because we haven't we obviously clearly not purchased enough servers and all the rest of it. So it's cutting costs. So when the money is coming in, it looks like we're making more profit. But then we'll have to buy more servers once the game's been out for like a week or so and yeah. slowly implement like- more. You know, but it looks like we've got maximized profit right at the start of the the game's launch. I can I tell you, I work for a cloud hosting provider, so I can guarantee you that you can buy servers in and get them in next day because we have done it. So I yeah. think we are a pokey company in comparison to EA and Activision or whoever the <laughs> publishers or whoever, whoever spends the money on the servers there. Maybe we should get EA to get in touch with your company yeah, that's and, it. and see what they're actually provisioning and then we can bring that up in the next podcast. Say, yeah, EA approached you and yeah, they wanted five servers. Yeah, five, whole servers. five whole servers. No more, no less. We'll keep a sixth on back order just in case. And four of them were log on servers. <laughs> oh. oh dear, yeah, that, that that would probably happen. Actually, I wouldn't put it past you. Uh, it's it's all yeah, it's just a money game. And but the thing I don't the get, Benjamins. yeah, all about the Benjamins. It's like, I, Did you I, see I, the Origin accounts are changing now. Oh yes, they're changing them back to EA accounts. Yeah, I, like why? <laughs> because Origin has become a pop mark on the face of gaming that uh, we want to kill the brand. And uh, go back to what we had originally. Because you know what piss, pisses me off about that decision? Is the fact that it took me about four fucking months to link up my old EA account from, from Battlefield 2142 to my fucking Origin oh. account. So I could play Battlefield 2142 again. Because the reason why I, I couldn't... Link... Yeah, exactly. I somehow, cause... <laughs> I somehow ended up with three different accounts. I'm like, hey, what's going on? Yeah, exactly. I've got two. Could... The reason I couldn't do it was quite simple, because when I bought Battlefield Twenty One Forty Two back in the fucking day, it's like the email address I used for that I no longer had access to. I couldn't remember the passwords for, or I had any of the reset details. So yeah, so now yeah, yeah, yeah. Why the fuck not? Let's let, let's just change it back to an EA account. It's in the game. It's like I don't know why Eight Batman's. Sports. It's in the game. It's like. It's just, just, oh, seriously, it's like a uh, list of bad ideas, number 5,623, Origin, let's rename it. People will forget about it soon enough. And it's one of these things, I'm going to go a little bit off topic with this one, actually, and it's, uh, I'm sure we'll get a bit of mileage out of this one. Drop yourselves in, folks. <sighs> it is, Race. yeah, it's like we've all seen the horrendous launch that Batman Arkham Knight has had on the PC. And we have, no, no, I'm not, I'm not tying into that well i am a little bit god damn it but no uh the the thing is though it's like what we've really seen is because i think it's generally the accepted consensus that because steam introduced refunds is why we saw warner brothers have to do the quickest soft shoe shuffle and moonwalk out of that scenario i've ever seen and i've never seen anybody take a game off sale before we mentioned this in last week's podcast now Here's a concept for you. Discussion point. Now, while, let's face it, Steam is like Walmart. It's fucking huge. And distributors don't fuck with Walmart. You know, it's like they, they will go through them. They, they, they will always sell to where they get the volume. But we've seen it with Origin. We've seen it with Uplay. How long, if this keeps up, because let's face it, it's like, Developers on the PC front have gotten away with being lazy as you like for quite some time and saying, oh, we'll patch it up later. Some developers, Warner Brothers, even going as far to say, it's like, oh, we're not going to patch the game because we're still working on DLC. We know it's broken, but here's some new stuff for the broken game that you still can't play anyway. Uh, Yeah, wonderful. Now, oh shit, people are getting their money back. Um, We, oh shit, uh, yeah, stop selling it, Uh, we'll have to fix it. Do we think that this may, now I already have my opinion on it, but do we think this may result in a scenario where we see more proprietary first person distribution platforms, you know, like Origin, like Uplay? Or do we think that 
we will actually start to see something that is close to, you know, hopefully see some improvement on the PC development front. Sound off. I don't think so. Um, Because one, it costs a lot of money to put those into play. Mm. And as we discussed a moment ago, they're they're not keen on putting that much investment into this. Especially for a market they're they're showing that they're not huge into. Um, They're just doing it for the extra bucks and for, I think a lot of these guys are doing it for the retroness of it. Like the the EAs for the Battlefields, because it's stupid not to release a Battlefield game on the PC. Same on COD, because that's where they started. But I just I reckon we're going to start to see a drop off of PC ports, and the just games will just no longer be released for the PC. And I don't think it's mm. done any damage um, because you look at the Halo series. Halo One took like a year for it to come out on the PC, if not longer, and Halo Two took a lot longer than that to come out. And I don't think they've even ever released Halo Three on the PC. No, they never have. No, I agree. Because like that, Microsoft to be did it. Mm. I just think um, it's like, I mean, you'll remember like even, I don't know, let me see, about 10 years ago, the PC gaming scene was that kind of, it kind of dropped off again and it was getting a bit quieter and there wasn't really any games coming out for the PC at that point and, and whatnot. And then it, it kind of kicked back up with like, you know, uh, multiplayer FPS online. That's when it kind of yeah. got back on. And that's when games started, you know, getting developed for the PC again. So I think that like Richie said, it's like, Everyone, it's more of a novelty to put it on PC nowadays. It's all about consoles and whatnot. But it'll be a thing again where it'll get quiet, maybe, and we'll see it start seeing less and less games coming out, and it'll just be like you know, uh, indie games and you know the, uh, the small companies that are building it directly for PC. But I think it'll get quiet again at one point, and then maybe you know, who knows in another ten years time it'll be like oh PCs. I remember those. Let's make some games for them. Well. Let- you know, it's like you know the, uh, the the PC master race and their argument for everything is, well, look how good mine looks. Yours does not look as good as this. And it's like, yeah, well, my my console cost me like two hundred and fifty quid, and your rig costs you like five grand. So, um, is it is it worth the extra? Some people say yes. You know, you guys have got decent PC gaming rigs and things like that. But you know, when they brought out Crisis, for example, and like you know, the mm-hmm. Crytek engine mm-hmm. was like leaps and bounds above everything else, but. Almost no one on the planet could ever use it to its full potential. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even to this day, it'll still stress in. <clears throat> it'll still stress your machine due to the coding not being obviously updated for modern processors and GPUs. But yeah, it's it's and still you're not you're not you're not gonna buy. And because games are like as we discussed previously, are getting shorter and shorter in terms of you know actual gameplay. Mm-hmm. You're getting to the point where it's like, who's going to spend you know like two grand on a gaming rig and have to spend like forty quid, 50, uh, thirty pounds. 40 pounds on a game that they get to play for like four hours yeah well that's it i mean when you look at like when i'm when i'm playing my ps4 or whatever you kind of look at the game you're like well the game looks really nice you know it's on a, a decent system and whatnot and at the end of the day if the the game developer makes a game that that can somehow be better utilized graphically on a pc then you yeah, know there's a little bit of an argument there but if your ps4 is pushing out the same graphics because the developer made the game in a certain way where it can't be any better then really what's the point in having a gaming rig you know, at the end of the day it's kind of pointless i mean i've like you said i've got a pretty decent one i spent uh probably just under two grand on mine and uh i mean i've not really played anything that kind of pushed the boundaries of it even remotely uh compared to a PS4 or, mm. or an Xbox or anything like that. So, well, I mean, I'm in no way a, an elitist or a console fan. You are. But we are. We have everything. There's a difference. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> well, I was like, just to jump in. Yet? I haven't, but I will. Buy it. I did see that they were selling Join a us. collection for like £20 now. Join us. That's good. I need to get you that should. shit. You should. I will but get it for the new Halo game, though. Don't worry about that. You should buy it now. Make it happen. Outcast, you've been told. But yes, like the interesting bit I find is when we got to the stage where the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 had literally run out of anything they could do, and you know, like PC technology was then four to five generations in advance of what was in these consoles. PC gaming had a wonderful resurgence for the better part of 18 months to two years. Because we started to see things that were like just so so far advanced because let's face it 
you can only ever use the DirectX 9 API on any of these consoles. And DirectX 11 obviously reduced, you know, like processing overhead, you know, memory allocation overhead, and just allowed far better access to the, the architecture than DirectX 9 did. And we're going to see, you know, similar gains with DirectX 12 if the, uh, the tech demos and everything else have to be believed. And that's the point. Now, obviously, the Xbox One, you know, Microsoft have already promised that it will support that API and you will see improvement. And then they're obviously talking about, the, obviously, the cloud computational power for, like, physics and AI processing and everything else. So maybe we'll start to see a bit of parity and acceleration with that. There's no reason why the PlayStation 4 couldn't, license and use that api as well but yeah like you say what pc gaming has at the moment is and what nvidia and such were all advertising and still are yet to deliver on a decent single card solution for is 4k because you know that that that's been the big push in pc for like the last six to twelve months is like oh we we now have because let's face it it's like you know outcast and i both bought the 970 uh because you know they were talking about, you know, single card 4K gaming. We all know that's a bit of a bloody lie. Uh, you could get away with it on a 980 Ti or a Titan X would certainly do that. But you're still only talking about 30 to 40 frames per second with, you know, decent detail levels. But yeah, it's like the the thing is that worries me. Well, I think the bit that worries me is the fact that, you know, the, the consoles are having a hard time. They're, they're having problems. You know, we're, we're seeing things getting uh, rolled out in an incomplete state. The PC has just been completely and utterly forgotten about in the last six months. You know, just Mortal Kombat X, Batman Arkham Knight. The, you know, the list goes on of games that have just come out in a state that, you know, two years ago would never have been the case. Uh, we've always had to deal with broken games and post-patch releases, but yeah, it's... I don't know. It's like... Uh, I'm concerned about it. it. It does worry me, but uh, it's interesting to see developers have to take a back seat on it and publishing companies have to stand up and take note. But, you know, when we see, you know, as we said, EA don't deliver on anything for an infrastructure point, you know, would would this force publish? like I said, would it force publishers to say, it's like, oh, right, okay, we'll roll out our own distribution platform and then we'll be like Microsoft and PlayStation 4 where you, can, where you can't get refunds. You know, that's... Or, as Richie said... Well, you say this, like, you just can't be get the refunds, event. but... You technically, I think you can in the United States, because if you buy a game that's not fit for purpose, you can sue because it's not fit for purpose, and there have been many class action suits um, okay. about that, and most game developers, the US market is one of the, uh, the big ones they worry about. So it's like mm. they start, if they release a broken game, class action suits can and there's been a few for games uh, going out. Some of the mm. MMOs that have been quite terrible and things like that. So Yeah, um, people have uh, said, no, we don't like this. Mm -hmm. So it's like as long as you can prove it's not fit for purpose, which is, well, I can't play it, then you are fully entitled to a refund, I believe. So. Yeah. Well, it was a little bit off topic, but yeah, no, it, I don't know. I'm oh, I'd like okay. To see. I'm about to let my belly rumble. I'd like to see cartridges again. Do you not? I think it has solved many problems to video game cartridges. I mean, just think about the memory we can shove into little, flipping tiny little sticks nowadays. I don't understand why they don't release games on cartridges. It's, it's yeah. just baffled me for years. Production um, cost. Like instant. But look oh, at yeah, the, well, it's like... even a flash drive, you know, like. A slightly modified version of a flash drive, you know. It's been... Yeah, but so you, you take that from a purely fiscal standpoint. It's like, while, you know, obviously, you, I mean, Christ, it's like I was in Tesco's the other day and I could buy a 64 gig, you know, USB 3 flash drive for 20 quid for 64 gig. That is a phenomenal pound to gigabyte turnaround. But the fact is, it's like a blank Blu ray disc costs you know for like mass production like a cent you know or two cents per disc and they can get millions of those printed off for like four cents a disc versus probably 20 30 cents i'm, I'm just th making up figures as i go along but 
20, 30, 40 cents for the, you know, the casing, the NAND flash, the, the soldering, the manufacturing, packaging and distribution. Uh, yeah, we, we all know PCB technology was always faster uh, because you're accessing essentially, you know, at RAM speeds versus, you know, having to read from an optical drive, then load into RAM. You know, you take that out almost instantly. It's just, and it's accessible. It's good to go. When you think about it, the optical, optical drives are going to become obsolete very soon. I mean, I mean, they're, they're thinking about next generation consoles, if there's going to be a next generation console. Yeah, uh, or are they just going to be a software it, solution? It's all, you know, downloadable content or, whatever, or, or possibly even a flipping uh, USB or whatever USB is at, at that point. Uh, drive of some sort you know so i mean you would see if you made a console you'd save your money straight away by not having a blu-ray drive in there and everything else that's corresponding with it so what service i'd like to see is a service where you can have your own memory cards take them down to your local game shop such as like your cex's or your game stops or that and you can buy the game and have them put it on it then they've not got the production costs and all they've got is a unit in a game store that's got the downloads on it. So you pop your memory card in, say mm, you want to buy stick. the Rainbow Six, you know, or like the Division or something, hit the button, yeah. it transfers it on, you take it away. Because even if I had to buy a special one to do it, I'd happily spend the money for that. Yeah, that especially if the production for, for them. the internet. You yeah, know, exactly. The internet speeds for like, it. Like, go down here and get it, yeah. Patched it and all. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I know your internet's not exactly the, the greatest in the world there, Hellcast, so how long do you think it would take you to download like a, a 30 gig game? Nowadays, since I upgraded to fibre, uh, it'd be a lot faster. Are you on the, the old fibre now? You've joined yeah, us in the 21st century. I have, yeah. But <laughs> the old 21st century network. I mean, I live out in the sticks, so I mean, beforehand, it probably would have taken like, you know, the whole day slash night to download something that size. But yeah. now it's just like probably about an, an hour or something to do that now, but yeah. Uh, since I and you can't even so... you, you can't even use your console while you're downloading because it pauses the download when you as soon as you jump oh, into yeah. a game. Yeah, so you have to leave it on, it. and it's like I had this I had this really annoying problem on my like uh, Xbox and I was downloading games was it would go into its auto power off, so I'd just leave it, go away, come back like six hours later, and it'd be switched off, and the download had only been like twenty percent in. Well, my PS4 like, was doing the same damn thing to me. Like I put it in standby mode because it says it will still <clears> download <throat> and charge your controller for you, and I was like. Fuck mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. I'll go and do whatever I want to do. See you later. Turn the TV off. Gone. Come back. And it was switched back on. It was the exact same point that I left it on. And think. And then I'm like, I've been away for like six hours. Why is this not downloaded? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't. Know, I don't know what's wrong with those features, but. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah I but think that's that would be pretty like cool. Just go to a shop, <clears throat> shove your stick in, boom, flash, done. Pretty cool. Excellent choice of freezing there. Just go to the shop, stick it in, done. Kind of thing is, Spoken like a man. <laughs> um, you would need proprietary USB or flash, like uh, SD cards, because otherwise yeah. they'd be extremely easy to copy. It has to be like a like a like a, like a natural like a system or till unit that was specifically branded or whatever for that type of thing, and that'd be it, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I think so. pu purely just. Uh, in the, the realm of hypothesis more than anything else. The the way you could do it and actually, yeah, the, the idea of using like obviously uh USB media, you could just use standard USB three. But what you have to do is with similar to what Microsoft do, is one, I would say a proprietary file system, certainly. Mm -hmm. Two it has to be linked to your gamer tag or your PlayStation Network account, and then obviously the purchase made, and then much like what we back in the day were like Sky Go player, a key for decrypting the information is associated with your account. Now, providing those encryption keys don't get cracked, then fine, you can copy that data between twelve hundred sticks. But if they don't have your account to log into, then the data is perfectly safe. I mean, all yeah, the like keys, the, old, um, all the, um, the sticks themselves can have their own encryption built into it, sort of thing. And yeah, yeah. yeah. it, it, it comes back the, to license management. The the old DVD drives in the uh, the Xbox E6 they were all specifically Coded. programmed in the, the in the drivers and yeah. controllers on it to only work with one console. Like you can take it to another console, it would yeah. only work with your one individual console. So that kind of sucks. You know, when you're, you're, uh, 
considering how yeah, often so like... the fucking drives died in those things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But they could do something similar. So when you put your drive in and format it, it formats it with a specific encryption that is only recognized by your console for reading the data. Yeah. Again, it's, it's you know, well, it's like, well, Apple do it with iTunes where you can register X number of devices. Amazon do it with uh, Prime Instant Video. It's like, you know, I've I've got several of my films downloaded onto my NAS just for, you know, for that dire situation where my broadband does go down. I can still get some of my, some of the films that I purchased on demand. Uh, and yeah, you know, that that's, you know, license management isn't difficult and it doesn't require an onset and always on internet connection to solve it. Seriously, let, let's let's fix that one while we're at it. But yeah, I uh, I think it's safe to say we have uh, rambled on quite a little bit. I think we may very well draw a line on the proceedings there. So I'm going to go ahead and say, Outcast, Rich, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. I know it was a little bit later, but uh, at least it's uh, it's just another one in the bag. And uh, yeah, well, thank you so much for that. This is podcast 17. Wow. So that is seven. Well, the scary thing is we're now at the stage where I'm about three to four weeks away from the year anniversary of when I kind of restarted my YouTube channel because obviously I've had it for a long time, but I never really utilized it. Uh, some of my earlier stuff was like Crisis 2 when it came out on PC. So, yeah, so we started the podcast probably about two months after I started releasing a bit more frequently. So, yeah, that, that's all. The good that's old pro- days. Probably a better part of about 10, 10 months we've been doing this. So, yeah, thanks for sticking with it, guys. And Appreciate it. it. It's the first podcast right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's like for, for all those who don't know, and if you've stuck with us this far, thank you so much. But the uh, the podcast started... And I wonder if Outcast can remember what the specific subject matter of it was about. It was very specific back in the day. Oh, Destiny. Uh-huh. It was indeed, it yes. Was, it was Destiny, that was it came what it was. The Destiny podcast. I was paying attention. Yeah, took you long enough. But yeah, it's like literally we did about four weeks of that when uh, we've run out of things to say about we can't it. can't take it anymore. Let's speak about everything. Hopefully someone will listen. Please listen. Please. Anybody. <laughs> uh, but again, guys, thank you so much. And to anybody who's watched, please click like, subscribe. Any suggestions for stuff you'd like us to ramble on about, you know, please ask us some questions. Uh, I mean, Outcast is very much playing Way of the Samurai 4 at the moment. Uh, he has been doing a lot of work on Dying Light. Rich has been working on, and I do believe we have a new title coming for the games under a pound on Steam. Uh, which one is it that's coming up next? I can't it's a Space Farmers, if I recall. Space Farmers, that's the one. Game. Shh, me the back in there. <laughs> that won't work. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that'll be the next one. Uh, I've obviously been racing my little heart out, so, yeah, check out all the videos. videos. Well. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, just a selfless plug there. I'm going to have a video coming up shortly about... Uh, Wait, we don't support selfless plugs on this channel. We do. Yeah, Outcast plugs himself every five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell him, talk about my videos too. <laughs> that's, that's why he's so happy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you were so saying like, you got I'm a video coming? i a video on like, the uh, PlayStation Network versus Xbox Live because I've been playing uh, Call of Duty recently. And one of the things that really annoys me is how terrible I seem to be. Uh, uh, the Xbox Live version, but when I go switch to the PS4, it's I'm actually quite decent back to my old ways. Never. So I'm going to do a video about it because you can notice some of the differences, and I think the uh, the Xbox Live has a bit of lag on it. So controversial, controversial. Yeah, but yeah, that'll be interesting to watch. But guys, again, thank you so much for your time. To the viewers and listeners, thank you so much for sticking with us. I have been SDM Kahuna, and I am signing off.